Welcome to Houston Sports Talk with your host, Robert Land. Thanks for checking into the best Houston sports podcast and happy holidays, everybody. Joining me for his weekly Rockets visit, Frank from HTX Chop Shop. And Frank, my plan until the fourth quarter of the Nuggets game Monday night was to talk about a couple of nice wins last weekend, but then Silas enraged the fan base by quitting on a game that the fans didn't think were was over yet. What are your thoughts about Silas not playing not one, not two, not three, four of the five starters in the fourth quarter, even though the Rockets were within 20 the whole quarter. They never, the league never got to be more than that. Yeah, I mean, I kind of, when once he did that, I disconnected from the game mentally, but, um, you know, it's it's more in a list of things that he's done. I know a lot of people took a lot of umbrage with that, but if that's what drove you guys to, like, get angry, then I don't know, like, what the, you've been watching all season. Um, to me, my breaking point was the Pacers game where um, Kevin Porter didn't play. And I think it was the Pacers game where uh, KPJ was out and we had opportunity to be able to kind of explore other avenues of offense and look at a kind of a different brand and maybe do something different. And basically, we just shifted the bug down to Eric Gordon and Jalen trying to replace KPJ. That 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 showed me all I needed to know about, you know, what our system and our philosophy is. So. Um, at this point, anything he does is just like, you know, it's expected. Um, it was it was weird. Yes. Um, but is it I'm, am I surprised? No, I'm not, because you could look at multiple games where he's either taking guys out or taking guys that were on fire or catching a rhythm. He'll just take them out. For example, there have been plenty of games this season where Jalen is struggling Then he might score like three or four buckets in a row in a certain stretch. And on cue he gets pulled out the game because it's like he has a notebook with a specific time and regardless of the context of the game this is what's going to happen so uh you know it's it's just another thing that we can talk about the game um you know I was really excited to see how Shangun and Joker were going back and forth with each other and how that was going the defense wasn't great but um that was a, a treat to see like those two offensive type of styles because they're very similar kind of play that cat and mouse game with each other yeah i i thought the way shangun came out that's what an alpha does frank that was impressive the way he right right from the start was just totally focused in and it was impressive i i want to go back to the fourth quarter again though because sometimes i wonder if it's a low-key tank by Silas, because some of this stuff is just so like, uh, wh what? I mean, I go back to the times he's taken Shane Goon out late in games. Go back to that Clippers game a couple of weeks ago. I'm sure you remember this one. I know a Rockets fan near the bench said he went to Shane Goon yelling at Silas in the huddle when that happened. Shane Goon refused to speak to any Rockets coach in the minutes following that. When you look at some of these moves, you're just like, well, would they be that egregious about a tank? Would they actually do that right in front of us and say, well, we're trying to lose that? Because sometimes you just go like, how else can I explain some of this stuff? Because it's it's basically the opposite of what you would do to try to win a game. The, the, you would almost pray that it was a tank because if it's not, then it's very alarming that a coach <laughs> be making those decisions. The reason I don't like the tank argument um, for a lot of these things is because it doesn't really – then if, if tanking is the justification for some of this stuff, then Silas hasn't shown anything that merits anything, any whether it's praise or anything for him as a head coach in his tenure here in Houston. So I don't know what he's being judged on by the fans or Rafael Stone, uh, for example. If if we, we're just going to use the tank as an umbrella to catch all, all the bad things that the Rockets do. If he does good, oh, it's great coaching. If it's bad, it's a tank. So I, I just don't accept that premise. Um, I think that he is trying to win. Um, it, I think he just makes mistakes. You can't tell me you can watch his post-game press conferences and look how just stressed and despondent he looks after some of these losses that he is willingly doing that to himself. I mean, the guy throughout the season ages like five years. Gray <laughs> <laughs> hairs, bag, you know, bags under his eyes, his eyes start turning red. Like that's not something you just put yourself through for – just to get fired at, you know, when it's all said and done. So I honestly think he's trying to win. I think the coaches are trying to win. I think if anybody is tanking, it's Rafael Stone with this roster uh, build. He's the one that's tanking. He's the one that's tanking having Kevin Porter Jr. and 
Dacia Nix as the only point guards on the roster. He's the one that's tanking as having uh, Bruno Fernando's the only backup uh, big on the roster. He's the one that's tanking, uh, not having veterans. Like, I'm thinking, who is Jabari's vet? Who is Tari's vet? Who is Jalen's vet? Who is? We only have two vets, real vets on the team is um, Eric Gordon and Boban. And we have literally like seven or eight rookies. Who is, who is helping these guys learn how to be professionals in the NBA? And to me, that's that's on the front office to make sure, because that's part of, even if you're tanking, you still need to help these kids transition into their roles as NBA players. And I feel like that's not being done because there's not even enough physical vets to even fill all those roles. So yeah, if anybody's tanking, it's the front office. And I don't think Kosa, I think he's just making some mistakes. If you go to that fourth quarter, I feel like Silas compounded the mess by having KJ on the floor in the final few minutes with four back of the bench players, Frank. And let's look at this. Knicks, Boban, Christopher, and Matthews were out there with them. Pretty much every Rockets objective onlooker believes KJ should be starting along with Frank. And on Friday, he actually does start when they give EG a night off. KJ throws up 21 points, 15 rebounds. Then that's followed by KJ getting 14 minutes the next game. And he's playing garbage time three nights later. The organization bending over backwards not to alienate Eric Gordon while doing their best to alienate one of their better young players. You know what, I I didn't even notice that trend until you just said that. And that is crazy to see. I mean, but, you know, once again, then when he requested um, or his dad or his camp requested that they make a decision on him, people think it's just, just crazy. But you look at stuff like that. It's not, to me, from his perspective, he's not even being a diva. He's just saying, like, let me earn based on my merits, you know? And I think for young guys, having a meritocracy is very important because it motivates them to keep getting better, especially in this developmental stage in their careers. And to be a young player in the league and you're doing everything you can, you're working hard, and the team you're on is pretty bad. And at the same time, you're putting in effort and making winning plays and not to be rewarded with, you know, at least playing time or consistent playing time is just, it must be defeating for some of these guys. And I hope they have like the, you know, mental capacity to keep pushing through it. But yeah, I I don't get that. Um, I don't understand the lineups or the, the same thing happened with uh, Garuba. You know, he's guarding Giannis one day, then he's coming off literally the next game behind Boban as the third center in a game, which I don't even understand those minutes Boban got. I don't know if it was New Orleans or whoever we're playing after we, Uh, We played uh, Milwaukee. I don't understand, like, what would even trigger to say, oh, I need to give Boban second center minutes out of the blue after my young guy just was guarding one of the best players pretty well in the NBA. So it's just like I said, if that game is what broke the the straw that broke Camel's back, my back was was already gone a a while back uh, with uh, with some of these decisions. But, you know, it, it is what it is for me. I'm I'm just. I'm just looking at different things at this point with the, with the team. It's worth noting with all the noise about KJ's off season that his agent says he likes Houston and he's mm-hmm. asked for an extension, but hard to imagine he'll have faith in this franchise if this continues. Well, he just has to hang in there. Um, just like we all have to do. <laughs> 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 I think that's where we're all at. Uh, I'm not sure. I hope the guys aren't there, but that's where we're at. Um, it either, either you kind of hope it is a tank. You hope it is because you just hope this is like some big master scheme. I don't think it is, but you hope it is. Uh, but it, they just have to hang in there. Uh, ultimately, then if it is not and um, our st- our coaching is not this great, then uh, whoever comes in after this has a lot of work they have to do to lay the foundation. And that's one thing that people don't consider about some of the things, the missteps that are happening now is that you're supposed to be setting a foundation for somebody else to build upon if you're not the guy ultimately, but I'm not sure what all is there uh, once the next guy comes in, but you know, that's, that's way down the line, but we'll see. I don't want to disregard some good signs from the team's recent play, but before I get there, quick reminder to support the show, subscribe, comment on YouTube, look for our live Texans post game shows with me and co-host Sean Bajani with sports radio 610. Sean and I, we're going to record a conversation in the next 24 hours on the Astros signing Jose Abreu, obviously a huge deal for the Astros. Um, Let's, let's go get to the good stuff, Frank. And in the last four games, in the last four games, Jabari Smith 
has become Stella because he got his groove back. A uh, little mm -hmm. 90s reference for you kids out there <laughs> listening. Uh, he's shooting 47.8% from the field, 43.8%, 43.8%. I'm going to repeat that from three. What are you seeing? I'm seeing confidence. I'm seeing somebody that's starting to just learn where he fits in the NBA. I, I'm seeing somebody that um, is just getting his legs under him coming off of a, a illness and then an ankle injury that may have muddied what he looked like uh, to start the season. I think me and you've talked about him in the past. Our biggest concern was not even his shooting was like you pointed out his defensive rebounding and some of the other effort plays that we expected him to be elite at um, and that he was suffering on. And I, I, I can safely in my mind attribute those to his injury and illness kind of dampering or hampering his, uh, his ability to do what he wants. Now that he's in his groove, the shooting, it, it was always going to be there. You just want to see some of those other things. And I think he's been defending um, pretty well, still makes some mistakes off ball. But uh, otherwise, when he's making the switches, they're very just kind of he knows what he wants to do and he's doing it aggressively. He's rebounding. He's fighting for rebounds um, on the shooting. He's confident in his shots. And I think, you know, this is going to tie into what we talk about with um, in the, you know, with Jalen Green. I think that some of the the opportunities of shots he's getting are more in rhythm of the offense rather than bail out just here and take this three uh, type shot. So, um, yeah, definitely he's been showing a lot of improvement and showing people why he deserved to be in that top three in the draft. You got to listen to me and Frank, because you and I have said two things. We have said, number one, he's hesitating a little bit in his shot. Well, that hesitation has gone. And number two, how many times have you and I talked about they got to run plays for him early yeah. in games? And guess what? Just as he's getting rolling, they're running plays for him early in games. That game he had where he had 20-something points and kind of his breakout game, I think that was coming off Thanksgiving break. Um, he They ran literally, I think, almost at the open of every quarter, they ran something for him, whether it's staggered, uh, him coming off of staggered screens or him faking a – a pin down then coming off a screen of Shangun. Uh, they were intentional in getting him going. And just like any other player, um, players need rhythm and shooters need rhythm. And, you know, Jabari isn't KPJ or Jalen where he's going to dribble his way into his shot or he needs to get shots within the flow of offense that have him in motion and comfortable so he doesn't have time to think about the shot. Um, and I think that them being intentional for that. Now, my question is, why did it take till the 15th game or whatever game was for that to be the case when you have a third pick on your hands you should kind of prioritize some of those things and get him in the offense early but um the fact that he's getting comfortable and the ball handlers are actually looking for him now and he's getting the passes like i said in rhythm of the actual set i think it makes a big difference for him yeah i, I don't want to be on silas's team if it's dodgeball because <laughs> you, you know his reaction time can't be good you know, it's like the ball comes, it hits him in the, in the chest. And about five seconds later, he goes, oh, you know, and he, and, and he throws his arms up to get, I don't know. It's just, <laughs> um, I, I said uh, on one of your Twitter spaces that if Jalen and Jabari play like the guys we thought they drafted, this team's looks, they look drastically different. Well, let's move to Jalen because this is now a nine game stretch where he's averaging six, six assists the other night. He had nine in a game. And to show you how he's improved, Frank, his worst assist night during this stretch is four assists. And four assists is a season average. So that's a, what an improvement. Yeah, Jalen has been on a, I don't know what changed, but this is definitely good for a guy that um, we heard that needed Jay, uh, 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 Eric Gordon and, and Knicks to ball handle for him when he's on the court. <laughs> uh, but in, in the past, I'm going to, you look at nine games. I've been, I've been keep, keeping track. I, I have it about six games back now, kind of when the team started playing more competitively um, between him and Kevin Porter, you know, he's, he's made just as, as many passes as KPJ, KPJ 295, Jalen 236. What's interesting is this is something that's been ongoing all season for the as pick and roll ball handlers and the Rockets are top five in frequency for pick and rolls in the NBA. Jalen is actually at this point in the season ran, ran more pick and rolls than Kevin Porter Jr. Uh, he's at 181 possessions as a pick and roll ball handler. So KPJ is 180. And uh, if you look at their numbers between uh, the two of them, uh, Jalen is actually a better pick and roll ball handler than 
Kevin Porter Jr., our starting point guard. So, you know, I think the eye test backs up a lot of these things that we see. We've seen him have that two-man game with Shangun. Um, for Jabari, that game that got him going, a lot of those assists came from Jalen uh, running the pick and roll. And, and when the tag or the uh, stunt, some they stunted at the at the ball handler, he would kick it out to Jabari for some of those threes. I think about three of those threes that Jabari got in that game where he scored 20 something points were from Jalen assists. So, um, you know, like I said, these are things that honestly we should have, I wanted Jalen practicing the same experiment KPJ got, we should be doing it with Jalen Green because I feel like that's there. And to me, it's more, it makes more sense to have that experiment as let's put this off guard at point guard on your number two pick, because if he does get it, with his other skill set, then you have a superstar in your hands. Um, not sure where the vision is that on the team, but I'm glad that they're coming around to allowing him to uh, to do that because, yeah, it's been pretty split in the past uh, six or seven games down the middle between him and Kevin Porter and, and ball handling and, and touching the ball. Is it fair to say that he's getting more assist also because Jabari is just hitting the shots when he's open, or do you think that comes off of better Jalen passes? Or, you know, how would you weigh those two things i think they're they're circular i think he's playing better and reading the defense better and getting the ball to jabari which helps jabari hits those shots which help his assists and so it's like they feed off of each other um and they feed off of and it's no coincidence even when some of those stretches shangun also generating threes shangun generates a lot of hockey assists for the team he might not get the initial assist but when you get a double in the post and you kick it out that first rotation is fairly easy um it's really the second one that gets gets the team and um Shangun uh, playing the way he's been playing in the past few games Jalen working with Shangun I think they have a real good dynamic between the two of them because Kevin Porter loves to the lob or to just iso when he uses the pick and roll he will if you guys notice when Kevin Porter uses the pick and roll he'll snake or cross across, uh, come across the face of his big a lot. And that is a method to draw out an isolation with the the whoever the drop defender is, because that's what he's good at. He's not good in the pick and roll. He's a good isolation player. He's And he is a good isolation player. He's the best isolation player on our team, and he's pretty decent and, and relative to the league. But what that does is it kind of mucks up the offense, and it causes a lot of bad possessions late in games where defenses are more keyed in. With Jalen, he actually runs the pick and roll to the full, like he lets it play out. And he knows how to use the short roll uh, with Shangun, which is kind of the best way to use Shangun. And when Shangun gets the ball, he usually goes into a post up because he's not going to go just slam it. And once that happens that deep in position, the other team has to help. And um, that's when they start getting those passes out that Jabari can feed off of where it goes out to like uh, Eric Gordon and they dro uh, drop on Eric Gordon and Jabari's in the corner able to eat off of those. So um, it's all connected. I just wish that, you know, we would be more intentional in generating those types of offensive looks rather than just the variance from night to night about what it, uh, who's handling, what type of offense we were in to run and all those other things we complain about. I think I know the answer to this, but can we get to the point in the not too distant future where Jalen's more the point guard, you keep Porter more off the ball and you solve the idea that you don't need a quote unquote traditional point guard. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the numbers you're saying. That's what we need to do. Kevin Porter is uh, the 90, 97th percentile for as a catch and shoot three point shooter right now in the NBA. So he's in the top like three percentile, you know, in the NBA with all the elite shooters go look at that list as guys that are, you know, just elite at shooting three pointers. Um, he's a good isolation player. He's terrible in the pick and roll. He's not really good in a lot of sets that involve uh, action. So that tells me, okay, keep that guy off the ball, right? And Jalen is better at some of those things. So um, even though we don't have a, a traditional point guard, I would love them to split it probably not, maybe not 50-50, but maybe 55-45 between him and Kevin Porter when they're sharing the backcourt as far as ball handling duties, because um, I just feel like, like you've pointed out, Jalen is flashing that he has that ability and this is the perfect season to do it in a season where we can be bad because when it's next year, I don't want him practicing these things when we're, we have to, you know, try to make a plane or a playoff uh, in, in that season. So this is the year for us to explore all of these things. So which kind of drives me back to that comment about needing Eric Gordon and Knicks, which was so wild to me, like why, you know, this is the year, let him, if he averages 10 turnovers in a two months or Hey, I'm I'm okay with that as long as he's doing it 
learning how to play the position and trying to make the right play. And that's usually what he does. I still find myself yelling at the screen screen way too often at, at Kevin Porter, pass the ball, pass because you see somebody on the perimeter open. And I know Porter has been pretty good in his mid range shots this year. And I feel like he's gotten definitely better than we've seen him in past years. But I still think that a open three point shot is better with most of the players that we have on this team than, you know, taking a mid range shot for, from Porter that's maybe 16 feet or 14 feet or 12 feet, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's part of maturity, um, being able to kind of take a, a lesser role on the scoring to allow your teammates or the offense to dictate what happens. One thing I'll give to like a player like James Harden, um, even though he was a scoring machine, James Harden was uh, had enough IQ in a, in a basketball game to understand if teams are playing him a certain way, he is perfectly okay with having 15 assists. Um, if you remember when um, Russell Westbrook was here and teams started trapping him at half court to force Russ and he would give up the ball every single time. Or if he's running a pick and roll with Capella, if the lob was open, James was going to throw that lob every single time. If the three-pointer to Tucker or, or Reza or somebody was there, he was going to make that play every time, depending on what the read does. And Kevin Porter isn't at the point where he is letting the reads dictate what he does. It seems like he has a pre preset, like, I'm going to go make a bucket right now. And he might get a great read where the Jabari is wide open for a three or the the big man is like under the basket wide open because the defense made a mistake and he still just kind of pulls it out. And so um, hopefully that just comes with growth and maturity for him. And hopefully they can, you know, get somebody to help them out, uh, hopefully by this trade deadline, if not next season, so he doesn't have to make all those decisions. I go back to the Hawks game and I feel like that's without question the best win that the Rockets had this year. And the Oklahoma City game, I know fans were excited about it. I get it, but I still look at that game as a schedule win because Oklahoma City was coming off the second of a back-to-back. Now the Rockets were coming off a back-to-back and you go, well, the Rockets had a back-to-back, but Oklahoma City had played four games. That was their fourth game in six nights. Whereas the Rockets had played just those two games in the last six nights. They had that long break prior to Thanksgiving. And so when you look at that, win you have to watch what was going on with oklahoma city they were 22 percent from three-point range they looked like they could not hit the side of a barn in the second half i mean most of the game but especially in the second half and the rockets were leaving them open a lot it wasn't like the rockets defense was all over the place i was looking at oklahoma city just take a lot of open shots and you could say well oklahoma city they're not a great three-point shooting team but prior to that game the rockets and oklahoma city were about the same in three-point shooting, 17th, 18th in the NBA. So neither of them were terrible. Neither of them were great at three-pointing, but they're kind of middle of the pack. And for them just to not be able to hit anything with all of those wide open looks. So I I just want to remind Rockets fans like, yeah, they got two wins in a row. And, you know, maybe last year they don't get that win or something's different. And obviously Jabari and Shangun played really well that game and and Jalen as well. But at the same time, I just looked at a game. I, I don't know what you thought. I just looked at that game and I thought that feels more like a schedule win for the Rockets and a schedule loss for Oklahoma City. You, you, that's why you have to kind of look at what's going on when you're judging your team with everybody else in the big picture. Yeah, I mean, a lot of our wins are, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to give them the OKC win because, I mean, it's still a win. I, I honestly think that just based on talent, we're we're better than them. Um, maybe not as a full, like a... Uh, Maybe their coaches are better than ours. Maybe they run probably better plays. I think maybe SGA is the probably the best player on both teams. Um, but as far as a collective, we just have higher and more higher end players than they do to me across the board. Um, they, their drop off is pretty steep after like guy three or four. Um, you know, for us, we drop off from like, I would say maybe after like Tari and them to like Knicks, it's pretty, that's a pretty, that's, <laughs> that's like going from the top floor to the basement. Uh, but uh, the OKC win, I, I still, I think that was a good win. I think uh, just the mismatch, I think them not having a true big um, really kind of was a lot of the reasons, you know, Shangun was able to just dominate them. Um, the Hawks win, definitely uh, probably a defining win for this young team. I think it was a morale booster. I think it was needed. I think it it helped them and gave them confidence. I think Jabari 
of anybody. One thing I took away from that game is not even the win. It's, it's the fact that it taught me that Jabari Smith is not a guy that he's okay with losing. Um, and, and that's one thing I can appreciate about him. That's another, you know, something that I'm excited about because he's a no nonsense player. Like you're not going to play with him. And the, when, uh, Murray slapped him on the head, he waited till a dead ball to address the issue. And, you know, you coupled that with his interaction with Jalen, you know, this dude is tough. He's not like, even though he's young, he's 19. If y'all remember him and Jalen got to it on the sidelines over a play. I love stuff like that because. You know, if you hear him talk, he always talks about the losses and how it's unacceptable and things like along those nature where Jalen had made a comment that really kind of disappointed me a few weeks ago where he said that, oh, they lost because they're still learning or, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but they're a rebuilding team. And, you know, I don't want him saying that. We can say that. Silas can say that. Rafael Stone can say that. But I never want my any of my players using the tanking excuse or we're young excuse as a reason why they lost a the game. You should want to win every, I don't care if you're playing the Jordan bulls, you should want to win every single game. And Jabari brings that energy every night. And I think him coming alive is probably the best gift from that Atlanta game. But um, yeah, that was a great win. Uh, they fought back and yeah, I think hopefully that kind of lets them know that they can do, you know, a lot of these things that they're trying to do despite whatever they're going through. Um, with the team or the coaching or anything like that. I was thinking about this the other day, and I'm, I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Which Rocket do you feel like is most likely to become the vocal leader for this team? Does it have to be Jalen? Could it be Jabari, even though Jalen is the best player, you would think? I mean, who who do you think is the vote? And who's the vocal leader now? Is That's a um, great question. They, I think Tate is. When he's playing, Tate is uh, very vocal. He talks a lot. He was he's been like that his time here. And uh, to answer your question, I no the the vocal leader that it's almost it's never it's almost never the the best player. You look at Golden State, it's Draymond. You know he's their maybe second or third best, maybe third best, probably second most important player on their team. Um, if you look at the Spurs, um, it wasn't Tim. You yeah. know, Tim was <laughs> wasn't Tim. So whether it was Tony or or I'm not even sure who would it be um, on their team, but I'm sure some of the Spurs fans may know. But I know it wasn't Tim Duncan. Um, you know, you just look across some of these championship teams. It's always the just random guys or just there are certain guys that are, have that role um, that do it. I think in the future when they get really reach their peaks, I think Jabari has the makings of one of those guys. He's a fiery dude. I saw that at Auburn. Um, if you just watch some of his games at Auburn, he talks a lot and he talks a lot of trash and he is a, you know, he gets in people's faces, he gets in his teammates faces. And um, I think that energy is contagious and it can change the character of a team when one of your better players, and I, it is important that they can hoop it, uh, one of your better players is, is like no nonsense. Um, but yeah, I think Tate is right now. And I think Tate, when he comes back, um, I'm looking forward to him coming back because I think we've missed, some of that energy. Um, I don't want to see him and Jabari um, kind of pair together and, and add more to just, you know, we have the goon squad, but I feel like there's other matchups and lineups that we could put together that have that energy and defensive tenacity that, that uh, they could bring. How much longer do you feel like it's going to take before the Rockets give Ty Ty Washington a shot and bring him up? He's playing pretty well in the G league. I don't have a lot of people get really excited about G league stats and, Deshaun, Deshaun Nix was great last year in the G League. Yeah. I, you you have to throw all of that stuff away. Yeah. It's just, I, I mean, I don't know if he's going to be worse than Deshaun even today. If it was, if he played tomorrow, much less in a month or two. I mean, how, how much longer do you think it should be? Um, I, I'm not sure because, like you said, the G League thing is is kind of hard to gauge. One thing I I do like to see is that the guy stands out. So that tells me they belong in the NBA and not the G League. If Ty Ty went down to the G League and was average or just okay, then I'd be worried. Um, but the fact that it looks easy for him when he play, he's playing out there and he's actually like dominating in the minutes that he's in, um, then that tells me, okay, he, at least he belongs in the NBA. How that translates into an NBA game is a whole different ball game. Like you said, Knicks and uh, Queen, the G League MVP last year. I don't know if Queen is on a roster right now. Um, in the NBA. Um, so 
um, yeah, I think I don't know what the usually the Rockets. I'm trying to remember some, if there's any precedent for some of the other guys. Usually they let them ride out to about the start of the new year. Um, but I, I so I'm thinking maybe in a couple of weeks they'll probably call them up, or it might just be an injury or something that that happens. But I could foresee it uh, right around December, late December, around when those trades are able to be made. You might see Tata get called up and guys, uh, maybe some possible trade assets get sat down and then they can start doing that thing they do where they switch over to the young guys team instead of some of these lineups that we see now. I'll be honest, I haven't watched it. I, I feel like the thing that's going to put Ty Ty in this in that role instead of Dacian is going to be defense if they feel like his defense and the stats, you know, aren't going to tell me, you know, how his defense is, how his rotations are, you know, if he's where he's supposed to be, if he's fighting out there defensively, because I mean, I don't even know if there's an, any sort of debate offensively. He's probably is similar to shooter to Dacian because Dacian's shot the ball pretty well. But when you look at everything else that he does, how he handles himself in the mid range, I would think he can't be a worse <laughs> uh, uh, passer and just ball handler overall. I, I don't know how many times I see Dacian just lose the lose his handle. It'll happen three or four times with him dribbling around in it and and a you know trying to drive to the basket. I mean, I was watching that in the Nuggets game. Like he he just couldn't control the basketball. And I'm like, you know, you're a point guard. How do you not have a better handle than this? You know, and and when I look at the other Rockets that you know we don't think as traditional point guards and how much better a handle that they even Jalen has a better handle than even with all the turnovers he's had, I still think he's got a better handle. Yeah, I would say for Ty Ty, um, defensively, he's actually projects to be a good defender. He has a very long wingspan. Um, he's a better uh, athlete on defense than Knicks is, which might not be saying much, um, but uh, he projects to be a good defender. I think his, he, his issues are the same with Jabari. Like he was a rookie. And just he looks lost out there. So you're hoping that the G League time gives him confidence because if he if he starts playing to what he was drafted to be, it wouldn't be a competition. Um, Ty Ty is a very gifted. You know, I watched a lot of film on, on him uh, in the summertime when when we drafted him and he can make all the like all the passes um, on in the what I just like they have the quarterback tree in football in the point guard tree. He can make all the passes, of course, cross courts strong side he can make the lob he's he's a gifted um a uh, pocket passer and like uh, these little bounce passes in 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 traffic he's really really good at that he has a floater beautiful floater game that's very important for a guard that's not athletically gifted like him um he has a mid-range game he's a great off not great but he's a decent off ball shooter um that that's comes in important when we talk about earlier with Jalen getting reps at point guard you'd want a, a, a another guard that's able to shoot next to him so that, you know, he could run that and be able to kick out. So he kind of fits all the needs that they have. Um, it's just on him and he just has to show us what he can do. He looked real tentative and scary um, in his first few games when he first um, got his shot earlier in the season. But I'm hoping the G League has um, allowed him to get his confidence because I think if he just plays like he normally does, some of these we need a point guard stuff may, it, it may answer some of that if you can see his potential. But I just hope he, he gets the chance to do it. And when he does get the chance, he actually shows it and not kind of, uh, you know, just clamors up or pisses down his, his leg. Uh, it's all on him right now. Uh, but I know he is going to get his opportunity at some point. Yeah, my only concern with him defensively is I feel like he's just real slight right now. He didn't show a lot of uh, muscle and strength. And when I saw him in the summer league and in the preseason, and if he gets caught on a switch, he's going to get roasted pretty quickly. But yep. and not that Dacian is great at that stuff, but obviously he's stronger a little bit, can handle a guy if he's trying to take him down into the post or something like that. But we'll wait and see. HTX Shop Shop, any, any cool videos you got coming out? Just real yeah, quick. Yeah, we just, um, I, I just did a video uh, just looking at some of the things we talked about, looking at Jalen Green's passing. So I go into some of the stats of that. And then Alperin Shangoon and the whole discussion surrounding him uh you know regarding his defense and all those limitations and just quickly my point on that is that um if if you're if you're reasoning for not wanting to play Alperin Shangoon or to limit his minutes on this rock Rockets team in 2022 is because you're scared that in the finals game he's gonna be a defensive liability then I don't know what we're doing here we're one of the worst teams in the NBA 
Um, none of these guys are guaranteed anything um, as far as what they're going to be. If you have a guy that's flashing that he could be great, there's no excuse for you not to try to at least give them every opportunity to express that. So all this talk about defensive limitations in the playoffs, and it's just like we're we're trying to learn how to run pick and rolls with our backcourt. So let's let's slow down and just learn to do that first. Let's learn to make passes. Let's learn to win games first. Then we can start talking about issues that may be down the line five, six years from now regarding some of these players uh, um, like Al P or, or, you know, some of these issues we may see in the playoff series. But, yeah, check that video out. Um, I think a lot of people really like that one. But otherwise, uh, yeah, we're just making podcasts and we'll just keep kind of making videos with each game as they come out. Frank at HTX Chop Shop. Go check his stuff out. Thanks a bunch, Frank. We'll do it again next week. Appreciate you. You're listening to Houston Sports Talk. Don't forget to follow Houston Sports Talk on Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, the Google Podcast app, or the Stitcher app. You can support us by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or by telling your friends about us. Spread the word, everybody. Thanks for listening. Uh-oh.